This episode is brought to you by LMNT. Healthy hydration isn't just about drinking water, it's about water plus electrolytes. It makes sense, you lose both water and sodium when you sweat. Both need to be replaced to prevent muscle cramps, headaches and energy dips. But most people only replace the water. Why? Well, because since the 1940s we've been told to drink 8 glasses of water per day, thirsty or not. Drinking beyond thirst is a bad idea. It dilutes blood electrolyte levels, especially sodium, which leads to headaches, low energy, cramps, confusion, or even worse. This low sodium situation called hyponatremia is very common amongst endurance athletes, shift workers, and those who work outside in the heat, leading to thermal stress. The solution isn't to stop drinking water, it's to drink water plus electrolytes. This is where LMNT comes in. Just mix this flavor, electrolyte drink mix into your water bottle and you're good to go. It's got no sugar or artificial junk, just electrolytes. LMNT has your electrolyte needs covered. Former research biochemist Rob Wolf and Keto Gains founder Tyler Cartwright and Louis Villasener formulated LMNT to provide the optimal ratios of sodium, potassium and magnesium for health, performance and energy. They also formulated LMNT to please your palate. Many different flavors such as orange salt, citrus salt, watermelon salt and many many more. Just head over to LMNT to find out. Or better still, go down to the show notes, click on the link, the sleep for performance link, to get um, to click on this and get your free promotional pack where you can get a taster pack and no questions asked refund policy as well. You don't even need to send it back. So check it out at LMNT in the show notes. Buy this book. Buy this book. Buy this book. Please, please. Please, please, please. That's the start <laughs> of the episode. Today I am joined by Jordan Sullivan and Danny Lennon, the two great author authors of this great book, Making Weight, Cutting Weight for Combat Sports. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for coming on and having a chat to me today. I'm always interested in these type of subjects, given my interest in combat sports. So you're very welcome onto the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having us, Ian. It's great to come and chat again. Great. So Danny, Danny is based in Ireland and Jordan is based in Australia. Now, before we do a quick introduction, I just want to say, if it wasn't for Danny, this podcast wouldn't exist. Because Danny invited me onto his Sigma Nutrition podcast back around 2015, 16, I want to say. And uh, yeah. I was actually in Ireland at the time back home. And I did that podcast standing up in my in the kitchen um, where I was shooing my dad away from the door because he, he was like, what are you doing in there? <laughs> Except the yeah. door closed. So that was, that was, that was the, that sort of gave me the inspiration to start this podcast. So without Danny, this wouldn't be here. So Danny shall be referred to as the podfather from now on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear it, that uh, you, you've, uh, that sparked you into doing something like this. Um, that's usually what I can do help someone and then they probably do a better job than me anyway. So yeah, I think the benefit, the benefit is just having the conversations irrespective of who's listening. I think it's just a, it's actually a bit of a, a self-indulgent way to get people's time because people come on a podcast. So if you talk to somebody and say, Oh, do you want to have an hour's conversation with no interruptions? Yeah, I haven't got time for that. Do you want to come yeah. on my podcast? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's great for me. Yeah, I can yeah. finally have friends. Yeah, it's great. I get to talk about, you know, sleep and stuff for an hour or so. Yeah. All right, so we'll do some intros. Jordan, you've been on the podcast before, but for people who don't know you, can you give us a little bit of an introduction and background to you? Because you are a very famous man in the combat sports circles. Semi, semi-famous. It's funny, just a quick note on that podcast, because when I got you on my podcast, Ian, I listened to the podcast that you and Denny did as my prep for that podcast. And oh, that there you go. Fun. Yeah, what a little what a little mm-hmm. podcast circle jerk. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, my name is Jordan Sullivan. I run a company called TFD, um, formerly called The Fight Dietitian, and we started uh, a few moons ago. And we um, focused all our attention and time with combat sport athletes. And after a few years of doing that, we um we were fortunate enough to work with some pretty pretty high level guys and um make a few waves in that area and I've been very very lucky to connect and um, network with some of the best minds across um combat sports nutrition and we've been lucky to work with like I said some very very top level guys which has helped us spread a pretty big message about making weight cutting a lot safer and that's kind of been the focus of uh of our business for the last five or so years nowadays we kind of spread out and spread our wings into lots of other sports and lots of other ventures but we we still maintain a pretty big um combat sports base and and gordon what some of the uh some of the athletes you've worked with are kind of are very high level so let's just drop in a few names there so people know who you're working with because it's yeah, no yeah. secret really 
Yeah, yeah. So Leon Edwards, I got to fly out with him in two days. Actually, he's got a welterweight title fight coming up. Uh, Alex Volkanovski, uh, Israel Adesanya, Pakara France, uh, Dan Hooker. Lots of um, mo- most of the UFC guys across Australia, New Zealand, and we've um, you know quite a few in the UK and in um, the states nowadays. Actually, yeah. I might ask you later on why Dan Hooker went from a man with no tattoos to getting covered in tattoos within six months, but that might be another conversation. <laughs> I think that's, a, that's an off-the-board convo. <laughs> yeah. the, seal, the seal is cracked. It's like once you get your first tattoo, that's it. So, yeah. Um, Jordan, you're also, uh, yourself, you've obviously participated in some combat sports yourself, but recently you've been doing some ultra running yourself, pushing yourself in that direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Started off boxing when I was about 12, so I've been doing that for about 18 years, and then going to kickboxing then MMA and then um after I started TFD my time was a bit um not as available so I got really really into jiu-jitsu and went competitive with jiu-jitsu for about five years or so so I'm a purple belt in jiu-jitsu at the moment and um yeah once uh TFD started and started getting really busy I uh, couldn't stand the thought of talking to fighters 24 7 once it was my day job so I had to break it up and I thought what was the one thing that no one's ever going to talk to me my phone's not going to ever beat is that you can run out into no reception and keep running for hours and hours and hours on end and that's how i got into ultra running but yeah so i've done a few ultras now a couple hundred k's uh quite a few 50 k's and i uh, got a hundred miler coming up in a in a few months so it's been it's been very different yeah very nice excellent and danny for people who don't know you you've been on the podcast before but you run a very successful platform called sigma nutrition and you're like the you're like the Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson of that world because you even get to sit on a stage in a big chair and pontificate with a headset on. So tell us a little bit about you, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much me. Uh, so yeah, for the past close to 10 years now, I've been uh, running a, a business called Sigma Nutrition, where essentially we create educational content on nutrition and health sciences. And the focus of that has maybe shifted over time. I would say currently, probably most of our focus is on nutrition science and health but probably at a level where we actually discuss research and how to interpret it and what it means much of our audience is dietitians nutritionists uh, nutrition science academics um, people in medical practice etc and yeah i've been doing that over the past 10 years a large part of that has been the podcast which was started in 2014 as well so just a bit of luck getting in early before that podcast wave kicked off a few years later and during my kind of early years in the field of nutrition, I uh, was also a nutrition practitioner, worked with a bunch of different people, and then uh, started working with people in combat sports because that was my own interest. Uh, I was doing some jujitsu at the time, was connected to a, tr- a few strength and conditioning coaches in that area. They got me working with some of their athletes, um, and, and one ended up being a relatively um, well-known Muay Thai fighter in Ireland at the time, at least nationally. Um, and from that word of mouth spread and ended up working with more of those. And that's kind of got what me down the rabbit hole of putting more and more stuff together for combat sports nutrition. And um, yeah, that's what led to the interest in that area. And that's pretty much a few things without me, without getting too deep into the weeds, but uh, yeah, happy to clarify anything that's but you do a bit of powerlifting, Danny, as well, do you? Or are you used to any? Or are you still do that? Yeah, so I, I've competed in, in powerlifting for a number of years. I think my typical thing with athletics has been get involved in a sport, go all in on it for a couple of years, and then get out of there. So <laughs> uh, in, initially with <laughs> jiu-jitsu, yeah, as everyone does, gets addicted to jiu-jitsu, did that for mm-hmm. a couple of years, get up, get your blue belt, everything is great. And you're like, oh, I can't it's wait, I'm going <laughs> to... And then a while later, just different, uh, like circumstances changed, got into powerlifting. And because I didn't have that flexibility to say, oh, how can I manage to do both of these? I was like, okay, I need to just get really good at one. And there's kind of differences in how you might approach that, um, which might be interesting to talk about in terms of weight classes you might pick. And so then just decided to compete in powerlifting then for uh, a a number of years. Um, Did that kind of just at a national level here in ireland never uh, an elite world class level or anything like that and then more recently just been general training without too much competing in, in the last year or two but um yeah that's a bit about having a bit of fun yeah. and were you a school teacher danny at one stage I actually was, yeah, for a year. Yeah, when I, when I first graduated, I uh, graduated with a degree in biology and physics 
uh, that had a concurrent teacher education uh, diploma in it. And so, yeah, actually ended up teaching for a year here in Ireland um, to like high school level, um, I suppose. And then just decided during that time, this is not for me. Uh, I'm kind of quite conflict averse. Uh, I don't like giving out to people. I didn't like telling kids what to do and shouting at them. I was like, fuck, they've got their own stuff going on in their lives. Probably because I was quite young. I was like, like 21 when I first had that job. I was like, I kind of know where they're at. But that's not a good combination for a, a teacher. You kind of need to <laughs> yeah, yeah. bring the hammer down and you need to be uh, the adult. So yeah, I decided to leave uh, at the end of that school year. Um, and because my contract was up, was that in a position of, okay, either go and look for a full-time job and then I'll probably never leave it. Uh, or it might be much more difficult to leave. Whereas now my contract finished, maybe I'll go do something else. And that's when I went and did my master's in nutritional sciences and the uh, kind of rest is history then. Yeah. Excellent. All right. So let's talk about this book that you guys recently published. And it's a, it's a really nice book. And I want to just say it from the outset, it's really nicely put together in terms of just ease of navigating it through. And so for anybody that picks up this book, it, you, it's not a book you kind of read start to finish. It's a great book to just jump around in. It's laid out really nicely. It's got lots of tables and figures and it's really easy to follow along, particularly if you're someone like me that's not a nutritionist or a, diet, a dietitian. Um, you've got these nice little practical tips in here as well. They're highlighted. So it's a real good guide. I think if you're a coach out there and you're you know, leading or working with athletes, couldn't wait. This is a great reference guide for you if you're an athlete as well. Uh, this is a great reference guide for you. So I think if you're anywhere in the in the sort of combat sports, this is this is an absolute must for you to get. It's also interesting that it kind of looks like the book for dummies as well. Was that intentional or not? You know, you get those like making way for dummies or computer coding for dummies. It kind of looks like that in terms of the yellow and black. Our book was written by dummies as opposed to be read by them. So. <laughs> yeah. And there we go, folks. He's doing two shows a night. <laughs> there we go. So, Jordan, um, how did you start this book? How What led to this collaboration? Because you guys are on the opposite ends of the of the globe. Um, and so how did you lead, how did this collaboration start with Danny to write this book and, and why, why did you want to write this book? I think there's, um, it was three years in the making this book and it was, it was a long time. Like it was a long time putting this together when it started, Danny actually initiated the conversation. It, it was, it was long overdue. I think, I think in this area, I had attempted to do something like this many, many times over. There were times where I, I spoke to other sporting associations and whatever, and tried to put together like a best practice guide combining the research world and then the practical world. And the original thought that I had for something like this was like ad academically publishing it and putting it out as a white paper. And that mm. proved really difficult because yeah. the practical side of it, we could do the academic side, but then we couldn't really talk about what the research really meant and how you interpret it in practice. And if you just did that, it would be really unuseful for most people. And that was the struggle. And I struggled back and forth for that for ages. And then, yeah, Danny bought the um the idea and I think we both just sat down and agreed and thought, you know what, if we're going to write this, let's just write this and make it as real and true to practice as much as we can. And let's just do, we both had loads and loads of experience with very, very high level people. And there's a huge gap. Like we both get loads yeah. and loads of questions about this, like constantly flooded from students and other practitioners. And even there's, you know, other programs out there we can kind of learn, but they don't really go into all the weeds and you can read the, the, academic and the research about it all that but you know you know yourself Ian it's just that there's only certain things you can talk about in that type of style so we just said let's just blend it and let's just put out something that goes over all the research but then tells you how to use that in practice and then there's going to be this big gap and let's talk about that gap because a lot of people don't like talking about it weight cutting is very risky it can be very dangerous yeah. people don't like talking about it but by not talking about it you make it more dangerous so we thought stuff it if we're going to do this book let's just go all in so that started the three-year journey of writing this book okay excellent and danny for people listening to this and to be like what do you mean by making where does that just losing where for a fight is again and where how would you describe like making where or where cutting what how would you describe it to the lay person yeah so for people maybe outside of weight cutting sports or, or weight class based sports i should say uh, essentially the idea is that there are weight classes that athletes have to compete within this weigh-in is done at some time point before their competition and they have to weigh in and then at a later point they go and compete given the the time between that it's possible for you to bring down your weight 
to make weight, hence we're using that term, for competition. And then you might actually compete, your weight might go back up by the time you compete for reasons that I'll mention in a moment. So really the process of making weight for an athlete is getting down to the limit of their weight class. And we break that up into two kind of distinct uh, p- phases, essentially. One is a chronic weight loss phase, which is where you're actually losing body tissue. So this would be through dieting, you are reducing the amount of body fat you typically have. Could be some uh, muscle mass in some situations, but typically you're looking at how do I lose some body fat over a number of weeks and months to gradually bring my body weight closer to that limit. And then what people may have seen where you see these large weight cuts popularized in the media is the acute weight cut phase, which is in that final week, typically before your weigh-in, you can do lots of things that will rapidly and acutely drop your body weight on a scale that are not anything to do with your muscle mass or fat mass. So the main one that is easiest to think about is the level of water you have in your body. So if you dehydrate yourself, you will weigh less on a scale because there's no longer that water weight. So we can do things like reduce the level of uh, water stores in someone's body, reduce the amount of carbohydrate they've stored in their muscle and liver, uh, glycogen, and we can reduce the amount of residue that's in their gastrointestinal tract. And all these things will bring down their weight on the scale allow them to weigh in for their competition, for the weight class they're competing in. And then after that time point, hopefully we should have time to get them rehydrated, um, more carbohydrates back in before they go and compete. So that's a general idea. So essentially the process of making weight is how do I get from my normal walk around weight down to the limit of my weight class I need to weigh in for. Um, And typically that's done through a combination of a gradual dieting phase over uh, a chronic term, and then this rapid acute drop from some of these other strategies I just mentioned. So Danny, what I'm hearing there is probably three major phases of that. There's the chronic phase, which might be six weeks out from an event where we're losing as much kind of body fat as we can, or even potentially just lowering overall mass. Then we have the acute phase in the week before the competition, um, up until 24 hours before. And then we have like a, nearly like a refeeding phase right before the, the fight itself or the competition. Would that be right? Right. And and we actually, in the book, extend out the process for um, combat sport athletes to think more of it in, in five phases so that they're constantly okay. in this cycle year round. So beyond those that you mentioned, we start off with a baseline level of nutrition. So before even a comp- comp- competition coming up, you should have a certain set of nutrition principles that you stick to that allow you to train and recover at your best. So this is your baseline year round, even if you don't have a competition coming up. Then you can move into the second phase, which is what we call the fight camp phase, which is what you just mentioned there of now that you have a competition or fight coming up and you might want to gradually start reducing your body mass. How do you make sure you can train properly whilst starting that process of reducing uh, fat mass? Then you would move into that third phase, which is the fight week phase or that acute weight drop so in those final, that final week or so, how do you finally get down to that weight limit through using the water restriction, carbohydrate restriction, et cetera. Then the fourth phase is you move into that refuel phase, which yeah. is that time between your weigh-in and competition. And that's getting back in water, carbohydrate, et cetera, and preparing for competition. And then the fifth phase would be after you've competed, how do you now have this period of time that bridges the gap between just competing and getting back to phase one, which is your normal baseline of training? So in other words, how do I have some structure, but also not so structured that it's going to be impossible to deal with? Because as we all know, if you've been spending three months preparing for a fight, then afterwards, you're not going to jump into very strict, rigid uh, dieting. Um, And actually, we wouldn't want that. We actually encourage it to be, to have a psychologically yeah. different frame of mind here so those so are the five this, phases this is the paddy pimlet stage <laughs> correct i mean yeah that's a that's one option that people can do it's probably not the one we would uh, recommend yeah. but yeah i often a, wonder a, if bit, paddy, a bit of that i often wonder if paddy plays up to the camera a bit more and sticks out he's got a bit more and just plays up to her a bit of bit of deceptive deceptive tactics for um for his opponents who thinks he thinks he may be a bit lazy because i don't know about you guys but i don't think he's as he's as lazy as he makes out to be in that phase 
Yeah, I wouldn't say it's laziness at all. I'd say it's the opposite. It's like, how do I make then the the cutback even more difficult? You know, <laughs> it's uh, like it's more discipline and hard work that has to go in when, yeah. when he does start dieting down. But yeah. Probably just, better. Just to see, see how we, as he gets older, but we'll talk maybe a little bit about that as well. Jordan, I want to flick over to you because you obviously have um, fighters who come to you, and I'm thinking about two examples who you worked with. And without going into specifics of those fighters, two examples you've had fighters who change weight class. You've had Dan Hooker go down from 155 down to 145, quite a big, tall guy. I was quite surprised to see him go down to 145. Um, and then you also had Israel Adesanya go up from 185 to 205. And so you got two athletes that are going in both directions. But my question is more about if I was an athlete or anybody who was an athlete and came to you and said, hey, Jordan, I want to fight uh, in, in MMA. Uh, I get 24 hours to refuel. I want to I want to fight. Uh, my coach said I can, you know, I'm I'm basically 177. My coach said I should fight at 170. How do I know if I could? Maybe I come to you and I say, I think I can make 145. But you maybe say, well, how about 155? Or how do you do that? Because I, I hear a lot of people going, no, I can do that with discipline. I can just do it with hard work. And I see people try and do it for a few weeks just to get down a few kilos and, the, you know, they're like Skeletor getting around to feel like shit. So what is there any sort of scientific process or rigor that you apply to that to understand where they can actually fight at versus what they think they can fight at? Yeah, the first and most important thing that I do is I always um, send them to the Making Weight book and I say, <laughs> if you get... <laughs> Oh, a, I, have a, I, I should have, I should have looked up the answer of myself in the copy. Please hold. Yeah. <laughs> nah, it's common, right? Like, cause um, I think the most, the most common one we come across is like the most standard size of a human male is like 180 centimeters tall and probably about 80 kilos. And they sit like in this weird, perfect middle zone where they're like, Oh, do I go down to lightweight, which is 70 kilos? Or do I just cut a couple kilos to 77? And I mean, it's different for everyone. That's one thing I've learned over the years is that what I'm about to talk about, there seems to be responders and non-responders and, and whether that comes down to like a mindset thing, discipline thing, whatever we can discuss later, but essentially you just need to see what is in their body and we need to assess it. And our best way to do that right now is putting them in a big machine called a DEXA machine, pretty much just scans you and it tells us how much fat mass you have and how much muscle mass you have. And from that, we can look at those numbers and we can kind of lean on what we know to be the best frames for each of the weight classes in terms of how much muscle mass and fat mass they have. So in each of the weight classes across combat sports, we know that a lightweight fighter such as Dan Hooker, they generally have around X amount muscle mass and X amount fat mass. And we can compare you to that. We can't really do that unless we have that scan. And once we've got that information, we can run some other numbers and we can go, okay, like in that phase, Danny said that first phase where we're just focusing on losing weight, we can then get some, like we said, best practice numbers and go do some maths and go, okay, Ian, you're coming to me and you're at 80 kilos and you want to get to 70 kilos. I need to see how much body fat you have. Okay. You've say you're 15% body fat. Ideally, I'd like to get you to 10% body fat. Let's figure out how we're getting out that 5% body fat. What's a timeline that's appropriate that we think is an appropriate way to lose that. And a lot of fighters will make the mistake where they just dive in way too deep and they'll go on these huge calorie deaths. I used to do it in competing in jujitsu. I used to see a can of tuna a day and you've probably done it as well. Danny, you probably did it. Everyone's done it. We eat absolutely nothing and you just go into a huge calorie deficit to drop the weight as fast as possible. We know that's not the best way to do it. So we can figure out those numbers and then that puts together a little plan of, okay, Ian, we want to get this 5% body fat off we now have a timeline of how long that takes and now in with five percent of your body fat gone you're going to be at this body weight and then you go Jordy, but like now i can't lose any more body fat and you go that's okay because as danny said the next strategy is nothing to do with body fat it's all about manipulating water manipulating water so we can also look at that scan that you got and look at your muscle mass mm -hmm. because most of the things that we're going to be manipulating is based on your muscle mass so we can work out how much glycogen that you have in your system. We can work out how much theoretically, if we remove salt, if we remove fiber, if we do a little water intake and cut, we, we increase your water intake and cut it. We can work out how much weight Ian you'll lose in three to five days before you weigh in. So once we've done all that, I can sit down to you and go, okay, Ian, you're 80 kgs now. You do this diet, I can probably get you to 76 kilos. And once I get you to 76 kilos, we'll put down this diet, we'll swap over and I could probably get you to 70 kilos. Yeah, It's going to be pretty safe. Or the alternative is I, I look at all those numbers and I go, 
Ian, good luck. You're not getting there. You're going to go to 77 kilos. Like if you say no, go find someone else. I'm not working with you. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. I think it's, it's good to show that or to hear that because um, we've all probably heard and read these horror stories. And unfortunately people have died doing these weight cuts uh, with inappropriate information and knowledge where people do these savage weight cuts of not only not eating food, but dehydrating themselves significantly jumping into saunas and, you see some crazy things going on in the, in the amateur realm of people doing stuff. And unfortunately we've seen a few deaths here in Australia around this as well. So you definitely, um, you know, need to pay attention to this. And obviously you've outlined there that very kind of scientific method that you use to, to bring this, uh, bring people down onto a normal way. Uh, Danny, for, for you, um, when you're dealing with athletes, do you follow a similar strategy as well? Is this like a, is this, um, I suppose I'm asking, do people have different ways of approaching this or is it just you follow the same scientific method across the board no matter what? Is there an agreed strategy on it or would you come at it from different angles where individuals depend on maybe personality? And with that as well, I wonder, Danny, if you could comment on potentially, is there any ethnic factors that may play into it as well? Do certain you know people like Western European, white pasty lads like me carry a little tube around their belly? Are we harder to lose weight? Whereas versus maybe somebody who is... I don't know, African-American jacked is like, it's easier, but to have more Muslim mass. Like, is there any of these things that come into it as well? Yeah, so the the short answer is that the principles that we try and have are, as we've already outlined, that should be relatively similar. And there's a number of things in that process that you can kind of have as your baseline structure. But then for any individual athlete, there's going to be a lot of personalization, uh, not to use a, a cliche term, but that is the actual art of that coaching as being a nutrition practitioner that knows what they're doing and that everything is going to be different for a number of reasons some of those are how those athletes react to either those dietary changes um very simple example you could have two athletes with very similar metrics you put them on the same level of caloric intake and they might be doing the same level of training but they might reduce their body fat at slightly different levels one might just need to be in a uh, a lower degree of calories in order to make that weight. That's a very simple example. Then there's others when we get to um, some of the more acute strategies of water loss. We know that uh, if you put an athlete in a situation where you want them to sweat, there's different sweat rates and mm -hmm. uh, various different genetic factors that would play a role there. So all of that is going to be individualized. And then there's another layer of it that goes beyond even the science, and it's something you allude to, is that you have to work with this person as a human. And there's going to be things that maybe you might not put down on paper as the perfect ideal way to do it, but is the way you're going to have to do it with this particular athlete based on their preferences. So what types of foods are they actually going to be able to consume in and not go crazy with? How are they going to react to different types of strategies you want to use? What is their preference for using some of these, whether that's a, a sauna, hot bath, or otherwise? Um, and then there's going to be external factors that you might not have um, direct control over, as in what weight class do they have to fight at? Is the risk reward worth it because of the level that they're competing at? Uh, maybe there's changes to the schedule in around that competition. So there's a number of things that mean you might have to deviate away from an ideal plan. Um, if an athlete comes to you with a short notice fight, there's no point in us saying, oh, well, ideally we want you to drop half a percent of your body weight per week during this dieting phase, but they have three weeks to get hmm. down 15 kilos. It's not going to work. So all those factors are built into how you should operate as a, a practitioner and all the the kind of principles that we use across the board should allow you to fit in some of that that nuance and that manipulation. Um, so yeah, in short, there is a system that we've hopefully put out that's a nice blueprint for people to follow, but it's not a exact prescription. We're not saying, here's how we did a weight cut with Israel Adesanya, go and do this with everyone. Yeah. Rather, it's here's a set of principles of how you make those decisions. And the more you understand those things, then you can use them in a, in a productive way. If you understand what happens when you heat up an athlete's body in a, in a hot bath, then you know how to do it more safely rather than saying, well, I just need to get them to lose X amount of pounds. So I'm just going to keep going. Um, so the principles are there to explain or to allow someone to understand how these methods work and to be able to titrate them to the needs of an individual athlete, as opposed to be a prescription of everyone does this same weight cut, if that makes yeah. sense. 
So it's more about education than training or giving a methodology. Right. Yeah. So there there yeah. can't be one specific way yeah. of do these exact things, right? There There is some list of that. And we try and put as much practical stuff in there because as Jordan alluded at the start, very often you get information at one extreme or the other. You get people saying, look, weight cuts are dangerous. Don't do any of this stuff. Or other people yeah. saying, here's how to do it and just making up stuff. Um, whereas a lot of people that are new to the field, you start realizing there is no manual or textbook that you can come across. Even if you do a, a master's in nutrition, you're not going to understand yeah. some of the practical stuff. Yeah. So like we literally go through the book of, okay, when you're setting up the room, if someone is doing a hot bath, here's how you lay down the towels. Here's how you prep the room. Here's how you get the athlete to e exit and enter the bath. Stuff that you would never think of unless yeah, you... Yeah specifically being shown and so there's all that practical stuff that goes into it and that's what we wanted to, to include for those reasons so i'm just going to go to that chapter here it says that to um to put an athlete into a bath you should create a, a very um relaxing environment conducive to love making light four candles in a circular motion around the athlete whisper nice things into the athlete's ear and potentially play bonnie tyler duran duran or celine dion is that right I mean, it's worked. <laughs> I mean, did, did no, really... yeah, that's, that, that, I, that I sounds, that sounds like somebody that, that that would do that. Like that's, <laughs> I, it's a very like, yeah, I wouldn't want anyone with a camera to see me with those athletes. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's an interesting point, isn't it? Like it, it's a crazy week before a fight, you know. And um, we've obviously myself and Reed have done a study, obviously doing a similar way cut, which you guys be familiar with that paper. And I I published a paper to the side looking at the sleep during that week. But that was obviously a very artificial environment, more like kind of laboratory best. But Jordan, you'd know more than anybody. This is a crazy week. And you see it on these UFC embeddeds. And, you know, we've gone back together on a few messages. And these guys are constantly got a microphone in their face. People want them to sign autographs. They're doing media. You know, they're, and they're doing press conferences. They've got the win. They've got, and then not to mention at the end of that week, they're going to get into an octagon in their underpants, more or less, and fight in front of millions of people and potentially be like so embarrassed. Like I would be embarrassed to walk down the street in my underpants, never mind get in and fight somebody in a cage. This is a crazy stressful week. How much does that play into the whole weight cutting process as well? And does it affect every athlete the same or do you see variation across everybody? Yeah, stress is definitely a factor that can affect it. Like we know increased cortisol can increase increase water retention. I think the biggest thing I find with my guys is probably the sleep. And we know if they get the good deep sleep, if you're deep in, deep in sleep and you're you know, getting those good deep breaths and you're in deep, 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 deep sleep, you're probably going to lose more fluid just purely by the breath that you're going through. If you're not getting a good night's sleep, we call it the overnight float where they obviously breathe out a lot of water overnight and yep. they wake up, say, a kg lighter or so. And that's a really, really pivotal part. Again, you'll never learn that at university. A lot of things online, you'll never read that, but we kind of talk about this in the book. You rely on that overnight float a lot and the stress of fight week absolutely plays into it. Like you think about, especially guys from Australia and New Zealand, we're flying halfway across the world to America. The UFC don't put you in a hotel until Tuesday and you've got Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday weigh-in. So you've got four days and then you fight on the fifth day. So fortunately, a lot of our higher level guys who can now afford it They'll go in two, three weeks earlier so they can acclimate, they can get their sleep, they can get used to mm. the temperature and they can get some type of routine over there. And that's really important for their eating as well because if we come in with the guys who come in on the Tuesday, a lot of times they don't have appetite when they're meant to be eating. They're running around, like you said, in like media day is always on a Wednesday. These guys have been cutting weight. They've got low energy. Then they're getting asked about 17 million questions. Which are the same they're questions not, over and over again. Same right? questions over and over and over again. They're signing the papers, getting like, film and everything else you never want to be around a ufc fighter on a wednesday night at training it's the worst night of the week it's way worse than weight because it's post media day because they've just done all of this and they usually have like the worst night's sleep after that as well because they're so stressed and worked up and their nervous yeah. system is so jacked so it absolutely plays a role in it i've noticed with the guys as they get more experience they generally get better at it but a lot of them hire professionals and like and you and i have spoken about this at lengthy and they usually get professionals in to help them deal with that and to help mm. them get a better sleep routine, to help them, you know, get in a better mental state so they're not stressing out about this. So, and then, like, to be honest, a big part of what my role is going over with these fight weeks is mitigating that stress because yeah. that's just another stress that they have. How do I get this food? 
how do I prepare it? How do I cook it? Yeah. How do I know I'm doing the right thing? So just having a dietitian or a nutritionist there takes away a lot of that stress. But that's, again, something you're not going to learn at university. Yeah, yeah. You're not going to learn just online. You learn that being there. And that's what we've tried to get across in the book. And Jordan, how much does, um, say, a temperature, you go to places like Las Vegas, which can be, you know, over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, up into 40 degrees Celsius. Um, then you obviously maybe go to places like Salt Lake City, Denver, even Mexico City, where you're going from kind of what we call moderate to high altitudes. How much does that affect the weight cutting process, if any? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, altitude will play a role purely because of how you lose more fluid in altitude. That does play a yeah. role. I think in the weight cutting scenario, what you're trying to do when it comes down to when you're in the bath or in the sauna or whatever is you're trying to control the ambient temperature as much as you can. And Danny and I talk about this in the book where what is the ideal? But like you said, Ian, ideal is very hard to get to when you're mm. traveling and fighting all around the world. And in yeah. some places you'll have to go there and it's dead dry and there's not enough moisture in the air. And then you sometimes have to boil a kettle so you can get some moisture in the air. Other places, it's a lot more humid, like a sauna condition is a lot more humid and that creates less of that evaporative airflow. So even though the guys are sweating and they'll lose the weight, you're putting more pressure on their body, more stress on their body because they're not evaporatively cooling that. So they're not cooling their core body temperature, which causes them to heat up more. So these are little things that you don't really understand until you go to these different cities and you're like, oh my God, I'm in Salt Lake City and it's really dry and I can barely see the salt mm -hmm. going off, the, the sweat going off this guy's skin. Is he sweating? You just need to realize, yeah, he is and he's evaporating. But when we're in these more humid conditions they're probably at higher risk of overheating because they're just what we call dripping with sweat so yeah absolutely where where you are can play a role but you thankfully you can control that to a degree depending what modalities you use and like how you set up the room and a lot of yeah. hotel rooms these days you can set the temperature you can even set the humidity on some of the fancier ones and everything yeah and um, danny um We've all, we've discussed very briefly earlier on the dangers of weight cutting and, and in rare cases and you know people will actually will die from these crazy kind of restrictive things around dehydration or water loading and so on. And um, one FC, the emerging sort of MMA organization, well not just MMA, it does kickboxing, it does a bit of everything really. Um, I'm, I'd be surprised if they don't have crocodiles in one of those cages soon. Um, they have a strategy where they use as a, a SG like hydration testing. Prior to, SG. prior to the prior or post when or something like that is can you tell us a little bit about that hydration testing and if that is beneficial um for fighters is that good to do or is it just another system that can be gamified as well um i'll give some general thoughts and i think uh jordy will be able to speak more to this because he's had so many athletes <laughs> actually have to go through this in one so yeah, this is just an, another attempt, which in general is a, a good idea because we know there's there's dangers of, of weight cutting. And so it's good that people are trying to come up with solutions of how do we reduce uh, the negative effects by maybe trying to, as best as possible, get away or uh, rid ourselves of having to weight, uh, do weight cuts at all. However, unfortunately, the solution here where the... The hydration testing that 1FC use is uh, testing urine-specific gravity. And so the idea here essentially is if we use this measure, we can see how dehydrated an athlete is getting. And if we limit that, that means that's going to prevent these huge weight cuts. And therefore, athletes will have no choice but to do it more safely because they have to stay within these certain hydration limits. But uh, for reasons which I'm sure maybe Jordy might be able to touch on, there's essentially ways around that system and athletes are good at finding ways around any system you put in. And the problem then is if you have something that has some way of getting around it, then has the inadvertent effect of potentially making a weight cut even more risky for that reason. So I think in principle, trying to find a solution to can we, could we ever get to a point in combat sports where there are no weight cuts? great, let's do that. So far, I, I don't know if anyone has came up with a solution that works and practically makes sense and would work in the in the real world of everything that goes into it, not only from a health and safety standpoint, but also commercially and practically what these organization, organizations have to run. And knowing that 
athletes are going to find different ways around them if they can at all. Hmm. So uh, there have been attempts uh, like that and I've seen other people kind of propose various different things of how we can uh, test hydration, make sure there's no weight cutting going on, but trying to enforce that in a way that actually makes it safer for the athletes is a different thing. Um, cause I remember years ago, the same idea was, well, for pro MMA, why don't we have like these really short weigh-ins just like we do in other combat sports that will stop guys cutting lots of weight, won't it? It's like, nope, but it'll sure make it less safe for them because now they don't have time yeah. to get yeah, fluid back in. Yeah. So this idea that if we just make it less of a good idea, then an athlete's like, okay, yeah, I'm going to stop cutting weight. It doesn't really make any sense, but um, maybe Jordy, you can fill in on some of your experiences with the the one system because you've had a bunch of athletes go through it. Yeah, I guess the long story short, it's just super easy to cheat because it's not a very effective way to measure hydration. So like Ian, you're drinking a pint of water there. So if you scull that pint of water, put it all back, then what happens then? Like, so you'll get up in about five, 10 minutes time and you'll go to the bathroom. You'll pass that because you've added more fluid to your body which your kidneys picked up on and it, because that's changed some concentrations of salt in your body said, we have too much water. I'm going to pee it out. You're going to go to the bathroom and you pee. So Ian, if you go to the bathroom and you pee and you look at it and it's clear, you probably assume you're hydrated, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty much the, the scientific basis of how one has figured out <laughs> this hydration testing, because that's all urine specific gravity is testing because the urine that you see going into the bathroom is coming out of your bladder. But the thing is about hydration and fluid compartments in your body, there's lots of them. So not only do we store water in our bladder, we have water in our blood, we have water in our cells, we have water in our muscles, we have water all around our body and it moves all throughout different parts at different times. The most important part that it has to move in and out of is our blood. And we know that our body protects the fluid in our blood very, very vigorously to the, to the point that it'll rip fluid out of the cells in our body say our brain cells and it'll put it into the blood when we're dehydrating and that's important because when we lose fluid out of our blood we're losing that because we're sweating because when we sweat people go where's that water come from it comes from your blood it's coming from your blood onto your skin and then off into the universe and cooling you down but if you're doing that like these these fighters do they're sitting in a sauna in a bath and doing it for hours and hours and hours you're losing lots of fluid out of your blood and so, I don't know, Ian, have you ever met someone that uh, has no blood in their body? <laughs> oh, there's, been a few, there's, been a, there's been a few, yeah. <laughs> Maybe at a funeral. Maybe at a funeral. That's the only place you'll meet someone with oh, oh, not oh, adequate oh. blood in their body. So it's really important. But the thing is, is that that's as, as practitioners, me and Danny, and when we're trying to rehydrate these guys and we're thinking about the dangers of weight cutting, that's how we're thinking. We need to protect mm. the food in the blood. And we, when we come up with these numbers of weight cutting and everything, we go, we don't want to dehydrate them this much because it's going to deplete the fluid in the blood. But then the thing is with this one hydration testing is they don't seem to really care about any of that. They just seem to care about what color your pee is when it comes out and yeah. doing this in specific gravity. So what I figured out knowing all of this and a bunch of other smart people in this field yeah. is that, Ian, I could get you to drink five pints of water right now and I could say, Ian, just don't pee. Just don't pee. Give it 20 minutes. That's going to pass from your blood through your kidneys. Your kidneys are going to do the thing and tell your brain to say, hey, we've got lots of water on here. This is like all diluted. Pass it into the bladder and let's get it out of this body. And I say, hey, override that system in a little bit and keep it in the bladder and now get in the sauna for three hours and get all the fluid out of your blood. And we're going to dehydrate your brain, dehydrate your organs. And then you're just going to go pee because you've got all that good water from the pints and you're going to pee that into the testing cup, which will pass, but you're super dehydrated. At least how I would class a human as being dehydrated, especially in this context. The crazy thing which really riles me up about the one testing is that I've done it and, and we make it pass and we make it work. But I've done it with hundreds of athletes and, and I've got a couple of degrees and, and lots of smart people around me. So I can kind of inform people how to do this. Other people kind of see this happening and like people in Thailand and whatever, where, you know, in Asia where this is popular, they go, oh yeah, we will do that as well. And they try to replicate that cheating process, which what it is, it's cheating. Yeah. And all of a sudden, because they're trying to replicate that cheating process, you've just created a whole nother problem, which is mm. probably an even bigger problem than weight cutting is that now you're dehydrating the blood and changing all the blood chemistry or the blood salts and everything. 
And then you've got to have this really good timing to get the pee to be clear. And if you don't do that, they say, go drink more water, get your pee back clear, and then go back in the sauna. So you have this weird game of cat yeah, and mouse. Yeah, yeah, you don't yeah. hit it the first time. You're drinking plain water. Then you'll go into sweating and you're creating this really weird environment where you can go really hypotonic, so low blood sodium, and really hypertonic or hypernatremic, sorry. So hyponatremic, high blood sodium or hyponatremic, low blood sodium. And those are the two things as a weight cut dietitian, I'm trying to avoid it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to avoid them at all costs because you talk about people dying. They're the two things that kill people when we do this. And so you've created this system that's now just like putting all these guys at risk of that. So that's why we're totally against this. There's yeah, yeah. Sort of gravity at one. Da- Danny, I'm just on this point as well, kind of leading on from this. We we discussed a moment ago about like dangers and Jordan's alluded to as well here obviously there's some people probably listening to this or people out there uh coming back to jordan's example about i need to cut away for a jiu-jitsu competition on a saturday eating a can of tuna um yeah i i remember like one time uh, jordan just on that cut trying to i was about 76 kilos 75 and i was trying to get down to 73.5 for a jiu-jitsu comp and it was absolutely diabolical lying in a bath crying in the morning eating eating salad leaves like an idiot so yeah, I've I've been there as well, and it, it's it was absolutely idiotic. My wife was laughing at me. Look at the stadia, but um, yeah, I, de- I went back up to seventy nine after that. But some people, Danny, compete in these same day wins. Judo, I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about jujitsu, um, and I have seen this, and you guys might have seen this as well, where people will still nearly like cut weight and dehydrate themselves and get on the mats significantly dehydrated. Potentially, that that then leads to not only from a you know, performance uh, deficit for them, but potentially long-term health issues. Like I wouldn't like to be getting dropped in my head or getting smacked in the head if I was significantly dehydrated. Surely this can't be good for brain trauma um, and so on. So what advice or what difference would you say for people who are doing same-day weigh-ins in jiu-jitsu or judo as opposed to professional MMA athletes? The primary thing is the amount of weight that you should be aiming to cut. And so we classify these different types of weigh-in scenarios as the lag time between your weigh-in and competition. So for a long lag time is what we've been discussing mainly up to this point of professional MMA. You might have close to 30 hours, uh, give or take, between your weigh-in and competition. So that gives us 30 hours to get you back hydrated, to get carbohydrates back in, electrolytes back in, fluid back in, et cetera, uh, meals and so on. If you have something with a very short or almost immediate lag time, like a jiu-jitsu competition, you have almost close to no time really uh, between uh, weighing in and then having to at least start getting ready to, to compete. And so therefore that gives you a much shorter window, not only to get back fluid and and carbohydrate, but also those things can only be replenished at a certain rate. So you can't just drink five liters of water in one go and say, oh, that's the same as getting Mm -hmm. in over a five hour period. So there is a a rate that let's say, let's give it simplistically think of it as maybe on average, maybe a liter per hour. uh, If we were going with, with that idea, if you are cutting weight then and you have 30 hours, you have plenty of time to get fluids back in and rehydrate. If you are competing immediately afterwards and you're dehydrated, you are going to be starting that competition in a very dehydrated state and then progressively getting more dehydrated, presuming that you are competing across probably multiple matches or depending on how that uh, that is set up. So there's the fluid issue. Then you also have, from a performance standpoint, we know for these types of sports, you will compete best with full stores of muscle glycogen, which is that storage form of carbohydrate. Again, that means you need to have time. If you've depleted your glycogen, i.e. gone through a very low carbohydrate phase in the days leading up to weigh in in order to make weight, if you now are going to compete without replenishing that carbohydrate, now you're going to be impairing your performance because you don't have that stores of carbohydrate. And so, uh, again, if you've done a strategy that you see someone with a long lag time go and do, like completely deplete themselves of glycogen, then you are going to compete immediately after weighing in. You are don't have glycogen reserves to call on. So you're essentially just doing things that don't give you enough time to get you back up to a baseline level of being able to perform at your best. Um, and yeah, then there's a whole host of concerns that you raise around health implications and, and particularly uh, brain trauma, so on, of of competing um, 
in situations where you're very dehydrated and then you're also taking blows to the head is probably not a, a good combination. Mm. Unfortunately, we see so many people do this. It's it's so crazy. Yeah. And um, Jordan, when we talk about um, female athletes, do you work with any female fighters? Do you do weight cutting in females? Yeah, yeah. I've got one yeah. weighing in about 48 hours. 48 hours. Um, exact so, question you're about to ask, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so Jordan, what's the difference? difference because in females because we've seen some i suppose commentary about female athletes particularly in the ufc missing weight um they've women have said basically like you know this is linked to the menstruation cycle um the menstrual cycle so like how how does this feed into it what sort of differences do we have to consider for females um around this weight cutting you know, it might have fluid retention there might be at different ages and so on how does this play into it? and is there much research if any around this that we can draw on um, not much research. There's not much research in female athletes, period, let alone um, in weight cutting. So, so you kind of have to pull the the theory and the physiological theory from from that little bit of research. And then like what me and Danny did in the book was just what have we seen in practice? How does this line up and does it line up? I think the most important thing to say whenever we talk about this topic is like appreciate even 50% of the female population, probably this doesn't even apply to because they're on contraceptives and they're not getting a natural menstrual cycle the yeah. one that they are getting you have to appreciate that's probably going to be different depending on if you're on like oral contraceptive if you got an iud or whatever that's going to play into it the best way to go about it is to first and foremost track your menstrual cycle every female's menstrual cycle is going to be individual to them yes we have the we have the different phases that they all go through how you respond through those phases is going to be very very individual to you though and we have a, a few theoretical things that could come into play when it comes to cutting weight. Two of the big ones at certain stages, they can be retaining a lot of water and they may be more sensitive to the heat. So they may be at higher risk of, of overheating. I haven't particularly found that one to be problematic. I have definitely found that at certain stages of some females' menstrual cycle, they will retain a lot of water up to one to two liters, which translates to one to two kilos. The thing is when it comes to making weight is that if you have a female who is going through this, you need them to track. Like you should know well ahead of time. We have, I have a female, she's a world champion boxer weighing in in about less than 48 hours. And she got her period two days ago. But like, we know what happens. Like I know every time she puts on about 1.5 liters. So there are things that you can change. You can reduce the amount of total water that you're bringing in. So it doesn't, because you're already going to be retaining fluid. So it'll just over inflate. We'll, we'll dial back how we sweat. We might start the sweating process yeah. a little bit earlier. And with her dieting, we knew about three weeks ago, we just sat down and went, okay, like this is, this is going to happen. We're not going to avoid this. How about we just go a little bit more aggressive on the diet side and drop yeah. a bit more fat coming up so we don't have to rely on cutting the water just in case it does come up. And like it's come, it happens. It happens quite a lot. And she's not far off weight. She's still losing weight all the same with all the same strategies as Danny outlined and, it works and it is a thing. It absolutely is a thing and it can stuff up a lot of females. I think it stuffs them up when they haven't planned for it appropriately. Mm. This is coming back to what Danny said earlier on. Like, yeah, there is there is met a methodology here, but there's that individual individualization with the athlete and you have to treat them as humans and you have to work with them. And so it's it's always going to be different for the different person, different temperament and so on. Danny, um, what about age? We we hear UFC commentators and other people on you know, pundits or people on podcasts talk about, oh, this fighter now is, you know, he's 36 years of age. He's a veteran of the game. You know, he's really struggling. So, you know, he's going to just be at 170 now. So a classic example that comes to mind straight away is like a Nick Diaz would have, um, sorry, a Nate Diaz fought 155 most of his career, had a few fights at 170, but towards the end went to 170. Or even uh, Connor, who probably took a few supplements, then changed from 145 to 155, even 170. How does age play into this as well? And particularly for men, I'm thinking as they get older, then a lot of guys don't even fill out till they're 25. And even sort of as they get into mm -hmm. their 30s, their, their body shape changes again, you know? So how mm -hmm. does this play into it? So in, in a similar fashion to what we talked earlier, I'll give some general um, observations, but of course on an individual level, it, it could be anything, right? If we were looking at Yol Romero, then it's like, <laughs> Yeah, there's nothing wrong with his body composition or, or changes. So just noting this again, more anecdotally um, first, I think there probably 
can be situations where it seems more difficult. Some of the examples you give as well, where there's maybe a change in body composition over time. I think unless an athlete is really well managed with, let's say they're, they're training and nutrition, that we just know with people that it's going to be much easier when you have a guy that's in his early 20s, probably just naturally end up walking around a bit leaner and be able to hold more muscle mass if they're not paying attention to it than once they're in their mid 30s and beyond. And so with that shift then in changes in potential body composition, that then has a knock on role of maybe what is the uh, best weight class or the difficulty they have with it. Um, but that being said, it's probably, there's there's no rule, I think, that should say, once an athlete gets beyond a certain age, that means they can no longer make weight for a weight class. Uh, and you've seen some of the athletes with the best longevity spend their whole career in the same weight class, or some even look better as they go on and mm. uh, and are able to even drop weight classes we've seen at later points like, in their career. I was going to say, Jose Aldo is a perfect example. He went up to 135 in the end, yeah. And he was even talking right. about when he was at 145, talking about going to 155. But when he went down to 135, he... Yeah, he had a fairly decent run there for a little while. So yeah. 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 So it's it's a I think much of it is what situations are happening where athletes are just kind of naturally going through life and then end up, oh, I've got a fight coming up. Now I'm gonna start making weight. And with that, you can probably see that it would end up being more difficult at a later point in life than earlier on where it's much more easy for them to walk around naturally leaner, perhaps. But I think with the appropriate training and, and focus, there's probably no set reason why oh at a certain point i will need to transition to a different weight class because i'm incapable of making it um and as we've just noted there there's athletes that probably can go the other direction as well so that would be the the main um consideration that that's coming to mind there as opposed to you're just not able to to necessarily do it but i don't know if jordy you have any uh, anecdotes that add anything to that yeah, no, I think you you bang on with everything with the the physiology the physiology side. I think the big thing in that we don't talk about a lot is the mindset part of it, mm. because anyone who's dieted for an extended period of time and then got ready for a fight, when you lock in that contract, you see it with these guys. There's something mentally switches. It's like I've got to jump in a cage and punch the shit out of this guy, and you know it's a very intimidating thing, but it, it takes a lot of commitment to do it. And I have found that as guys get older their priorities change, right? And I've seen this with a lot of our athletes as they get older, they have kids say their priority changes from, oh my God, I can't jump into a cage and I can't put my life at risk like this anymore. So they kind of slip up the desire to diet so hard and to cut so much weight kind of slips up because they want to be around for the kids. Also on that same point, and going back to the Dan Hooker, going down to 145, sometimes, and Jose Aldo was definitely in this boat, hey, I'm stagnated in the 145 division. If I want to revive my career, I need to go down to 135. Or Hooker at the time was, you know what, if this lightweight thing isn't happening, I need to go to featherweight and that's where I need to go. So they do it out of this fierce desire. I need to revive my career. I need for me to keep doing this. This is what I need to do. So it's that mindset piece. And I've found a lot with our guys now that they've got a bit older, they kind of go one of two ways. It's this probably isn't as important to me. So I'm not going to suffer as much going through this process or it's, you know what, I've still got things in me and I haven't been able to do it here. I, I'm willing to suffer. So I'm going to go get back down. Hmm. And a final question I want to ask you before we do a bit of a wrap up is um, obviously weight cutting is becoming more and more popular with more and more people doing combat sports as well. Probably more prevalence of it or more frequency of it happening and definitely more fights happening, more organizations and so on. I look at these athletes and I often think to myself, how is this going to impact their, you know, their body composition, their endocrinology, um, their longevity as they get older post fight career. And we've probably all seen some athletes where you go, shit, I haven't seen him in 10 years. He's retired. Look at the state. I'm like, fuck, he looks like he's 70, not 50. So, you know, and that's, that's so it is a bit disrespectful to say it, but it, but it's true. You look at them. I, I do get shocked. And I think, man, you didn't age, but other athletes are fine, look even better, look even healthier. How much is this weight cutting, if any, do you think it's going to play into things like um, eating disorders, um, potentially leading to long-term negative health effects? Do we have any data on that? Do we see anything? How much will it play even into mental health um, of these athletes post-fight career? 
how does this all feed into it in the long term, do you think, if any? And and happy for you to speculate on it as well. If you've seen any examples, if there's no research on it or anything on it, just happy for you to throw some ideas on it. Well, we do know that for uh, athletes in general, but specifically weight class based sport athletes, you have a higher prevalence of eating disorders and patterns of disordered eating. It's one of the risk factors that's uh, present there. And like you say, I think probably the biggest risk is along some of those lines of not necessarily having done a weight cut in your life, but more so the habits you've built around how you've done that. So if you've gone through years of cycles of extremely restrictive dieting, over the top kind of crash dieting, not very good practices, then having a fight and then having a blowout period for a number of months, that type of cycle itself is not just, uh, there, there will be some acute damage potentially from that, but there's also setting you up to have potentially uh, from a behavior standpoint that continuing on beyond mm. your your fight career. Um, and it's difficult to disentangle from that. So I think there's certainly something on the attitude towards food on disordered eating side, for sure. Um, and then in terms of actual health effects of that, those things directly impact your health. Um, there's situations where athletes that have tried to keep their weight down uh, very low, or let's say compete in a weight class that is maybe a weight class too low for them, and have to therefore spend the vast majority of their time, even when they're not competing, in a state of low energy availability. We know that chronic low energy availability, um, so in other words, the energy you have left available for exercise after your uh, uh, energy, um, accounting for your energy intake, that your if you're in a state of low energy availability, it has not only potentially some acute effects, but more so when you're chronically in that state can lead to a whole host of issues from immune system, endocrine function, bone health, and so on. So uh, what we're seeing and some of the case studies speak to that, there is a bit of nuance here that it's not a situation where you need to avoid a state of low energy availability at all times, because that's just not possible if you're a combat sport athlete and you're making weight. You We'll need to do that, but it's how can we make that for the shortest amount of time that we necessarily, that we need in order for you to achieve that and that the magnitude isn't too big for too long. So in situations where athletes are constantly under eating relative to their training workload, that puts them in this low energy availability state. If that's continued on chronically, that's the pretty clear evidence that that sets up for impacts on a whole host of these physiological systems, uh, some of which I just mentioned. So bone health is one of the clearest where most of the evidence. So that would be something that would only manifest maybe down the line where an athlete then ends up with um, osteopenia or even potentially osteoporosis. It could have impacts of increased risk of sarcopenia. So loss of muscle function and, and mass. Uh, you could have immune, uh, immune system compromise, which means therefore they're more likely to get illnesses or other injuries um, and so on. So I think there are risks of that constantly under eating relative to workload and then on the other side you said the psychological thing of what types of patterns and behaviors are they building um, and are they going through these distinct cycles of extreme restriction and then almost binging mm -hmm. and that itself has physiological and psychological consequences hmm. jordan did you have anything to add to that yeah the only thing i'd add to that is um we do have a little bit of research about it carl Langan Evans has a, he has the one published case study where we have a Taekwondo athlete where we do see metabolic disturbances with these big weight cuts when they binge out, but they seem to correct themselves. And he's got unpublished data with a female combat sport athlete where he has, he's taken her repeatedly, like Danny said, into these areas of low energy availability, but only for a short period of time, takes them out, balances them back out and then dips back in. And it yeah. seems with that athlete, and this I could definitely attest to if you do it properly and you do it in the right way you come out pretty much unscathed from a physiological metabolic uh, standpoint the point that danny and yourself both made the psychological thing that's where the issue lies right because i always think of guys like gsp super headstrong super disciplined kind of that karate style taekwondo attitude from way back when you look at him now he's still in great shape he's still very disciplined like there's a video of him that went up the other night he only had one scoop of ice cream like one teaspoon of ice cream as his, as his dessert so he's still very disciplined most fighters aren't like that and going through this weight cutting process and doing all this just leaves a lot of lot of damage upstairs psychologically it predisposes them to 
lots of eating disorders and mm. then they stop the activity they stop being an athlete so they lose all that output but then they're just left with all these demons in their head and all of these psychological issues that have come from being that athlete and so not only have they reduced their total energy outtake now they've got to deal with being super low output and all of these other things like disordered eating yeah. eating disorders. so i think that's probably the biggest thing that i see it's an interesting one, and, and this might be a conversation for um, you and I, Danny, another day, because this is something I've been looking at recently, or just not looking at, but thinking about, and just looking at in some in a very light touch. But obviously, we see across the world obesity rates going up, and people being overweight, and we're seeing it here in Australia. Um, it's getting worse and worse. And in some of the studies that we're running in probably more industrial settings uh, for published and unpublished work, we're seeing up to 95% obesity rates using BMI. And obviously it's a crude measure, but it's a very good categorical measure to sort of bin people and see what's happening. But with that comes lots of other problems, such as obstructive sleep apnea and things like this, not to mention our metabolic conditions. But I often wonder with some people, and this might be similar to fighters, did they get into fighting because they come from traumatic backgrounds? And in those traumatic backgrounds, did they use food as a reward system? which potentially may be happening in some of the people that we're seeing in some of our research as well, where food has been a reward mechanism. So then when you start talking to people about reducing body mass, whether to be a shift worker or whether to even be an athlete, that psychological thing of you're taking away my reward system is really difficult for people. And I get your point, Jordan. Some people can go down into that and be like, I'm going to be stoic like a samurai. I'm going to do it. Other people after two days are freaking out going, I really need to have, you know, a chocolate biscuit, you know, for me, Danny, it's a, a snack. Unfortunately, the little purple snacks, you can get them here in Australia now in the supermarket. So I'm all good. But it's those little things that, you know, these little reward systems that people like. So yeah, potentially could be something related to that with the trauma psychology around food as well. So I'm not sure what your thoughts are on that one. Well, I mean, first of all, acknowledging that obesity is an extremely complex uh, disorder, uh, yeah. class as a disease. Uh, there is certainly a body of evidence looking at certain uh subcategories within that of, of people who will have eating behaviors that are driven by psychological events or predispositions and really when we think about how any of us interacts with food and eats it's almost uh, even when we like to give credit for oh we're doing it because we're rational and we make all our food choices in, in the best way a lot of it is actually not and even preferences for which foods we like um, tends to correlate strongly with what we end up eating and then what we end up having preferences for often are built from early exposure to those things. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of stuff going on of why we eat in the way we do. Um, so there is part of it that is that psychological, uh, but then there's other buckets of people that would be in a obesity category for that is completely distinct from that or might not be influenced that much by it. It could be purely um, there people with a stronger genetic basis for that and not that oh their genetics makes that they will be obese versus otherwise mm. but it's just going to drive them to have higher degrees of hunger levels and drive toward to consume food that we wouldn't have and so this idea of oh well tell them just to kind of ignore that it'd be the same thing as if i got you to the place where you've been the leanest in your life and you've been cutting weight and really restricted for ages and then just say okay don't go and eat more food just stay at this level of hunger everyone is going to break at that point right you take mm -hmm. the most extreme of this is elite level bodybuilders if you take them after they've competed and that level of hunger that is not something they can sustain and so that is a, a crude example but it's a kind of similar to what you might see in some of these genetic situations and it's why we're seeing right now this um really impressive set of results from the GLP-1 agonist, uh, GLP-1 uh, receptor agonist drugs, uh, so like a Zempic and, and semaglutide, that we're seeing once you give people this medication, then they actually can regulate their eating incredibly mm -hmm. well. And so that's why they're having this their real success and why it's at the forefront. And so it's kind of showing that it never was a, a conscious thing of, oh, people don't care or they're, they're just following unhealthy habits. It was just, oh no, if we correct it with a drug, they do want to uh, eat an appropriate amount overall. So that's part of a, um, a bunch of stuff with obesity is, is driven by health and wealth inequalities in society and risks of that. 
uh, food choices that they're available to, um, health services that they have available to them, uh, food marketing and, and role there. Like all this stuff is tied up to make it very complex. Uh, but all is that to say is that there is going to be some people that, of course, have food behaviors that are driven by psychological reasons as well. Um, so that that can happen, yeah. And do you see that, Jordan, with some of your athletes that, you know, maybe depend on their background to have this kind of psychological crutch with food? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, I think fighting as a sport will attract a particular type of person. And yeah, as Danny said, I think even if you aren't attracted to it for that trauma base, I think just being in that scenario where you put yourself through that and if you get that lean, then you probably will develop some type of trauma or whatever you want to call it. Like Danny said, when you get that lean, it's very hard to ignore those hunger cues. And then maybe you just don't have the coping mechanisms to safely get out of that and then go back mm. to normal eating. You don't have a good coach that can take you through it. And I think that's a, that's a big thing, right? And it's a big part. If we go back to the book, when Danny was talking about that stability phase, when we spoke about it and said, <laughs> it's probably pretty ignorant and pretty irresponsible if we don't talk about this, because it's a huge problem. And I, I would say, I would say as high as 80 to 90% of the fighters I've worked with would all come through and say, one of the first things they say is like, I binge so uncontrollably after. Mm. And the success that we've had after, yeah, you put them through the system and you do everything, but it's more just like coaching them and advising them and putting through some type of structure somewhere so they have some degree of control and, and at least appreciating like, like what Danny said, yeah, it's very normal when you go down there, you're not meant to be that lean. Like you're not meant to sit around and walk like this and mm. you're not meant to have abs all the time and it's okay to feel hungry, but you just need to have some type of system and that's what the stability phase is about. And actually, I've, I've, that's a big focus on what we've done with TFD over the last two years. We extended out our servicing. I used to just do eight weeks and throw them to the bin so you could just rotate yeah, 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 people. Yeah. But it was like, we need to be a bit more responsible about this and keep it over a 12-month thing and keep them. And, and since we've done that, we've had a lot of success with it because they've got these support systems and then they can better control that that post-fight binge. Yeah, that's great. So, gentlemen, we've come at the end of our time. Is there any other points you wanted to talk about in the book? Any points you wanted to raise? We've had a bit of a general conversation around it. I didn't want to go through the book section by section or page by page, but um, the book, like I said, again, is laid out really nicely. Those phases that the guys have talked about are all here as well in all the sections. You can go through it. Um, absolute brilliant book. A must, I think, for combat sport athletes and coaches where any time you're really using and manipulating weight, particularly for coaches, great way to educate yourself for a low, low cost. There's plenty of podcasts out there as well. We've had some podcasts on weight cutting. Jordan uh, has a podcast. Danny's got a podcast. Plenty of resources out there. But get the book um, and support the guys and 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 um, dig out this all these nuggets of gold. But with that, is there anything else you would like to raise? Any points, major points that I've missed that you would like to talk about? No, I don't think I'm all, I'm all good. I think that was a yeah, that was fun. We got through a lot of stuff, so nothing that's come to mind. No, that's good. If you, do, if you do like the book, don't be shy to go to Amazon and leave a review, though. They they definitely help. Yeah, well, I definitely will. I'll jump on and leave a review myself, and we'll put the link into the show notes. We'll get this out um, before Christmas. Um, order it. It came very quick on Amazon, um, so it's very good. So maybe if you're looking for a birthday present, maybe you've got a, a boyfriend, girlfriend, uncle, cousin, dad, auntie, grandmother, somebody who's who coaches athletes, get them this book. It'll be a nice present. It's Like I say, I can't compliment it enough on how it's laid out. I'll be honest, gentlemen, I've been grappling with writing a book myself for the last couple of years and time is not on my side. Um, and so this actually, I was like, wow, this is exactly how I would like to lay it out. This book and another book by a guy called Mark Bubbs. He's got a book called Peak Performance, two very similar styles. But this to me was, uh, this has been sitting on the edge of my desk because every time I'm trying to write a few pages for my book, I keep looking at this as a bit of a guide. So well done. Congratulations. A brilliant book. And so wish you all the best for that and hopefully sell a couple of copies out of this at least. <laughs> oh, thanks very much. I appreciate the kind words. Yeah, a lot of, like Jordy says, has gone into it. So yeah, we're glad that people are enjoying it. We'll put that link in the show notes. But um, Danny, if people want to get a hold of you, they want to find out more about you, they want to um, listen to your work, how, what's the best way to get a hold of you or follow you? They can find all my stuff at sigmanutrition.com or if they just put my name into Instagram and Twitter, they'll see me there. And then for the book is just makingweightbook.com. Excellent. And for you, Jordan? Yeah. Uh, most of our details are on the website, www.thefightdietitian.com, Instagram at the underscore fight dietitian. Or if you want to shoot us an email, info at thefightdietitian.com. Excellent. And we'll finish the podcast with the great word from martial arts, us. <laughs>